Okay, hello guys. <coughs> yeah, welcome to my talk about the work with atomic, uh, atomic design. I heard that Rasmus yesterday did stuff like showing dogs because he hates dogs and showing monkeys because he loves them. So I thought maybe I show some horses because I'm really <laughs> addicted of those. But then I talked to Christopher and he said, don't do that. You will look like a girly then and nobody will really think you can do what you yeah, do at work or whatever. So I thought, okay, I drop the horses. I'll show you lovely websites. So do you know what that is? Maybe a website which lost some style sheets or something like that? Nope. It's the very first website which was launched from CERN and yeah, I think that was the time where web design was really easy. You just put some markup, some HTML and text on the website and that's it. Okay, it got a bit better. Maybe they already had some designers who thought about wow, how should that website look like, but still not that sexy. Okay, then the time came the websites were a bit nicer. You started to design them and thought about how they might look like, but it still was quite static, the web design. So you had a resolution in mind for which you wanted to support your website. Yeah, and that's what was created. So the way the world changed a bit. That one came on. So there was the iPhone. You had to keep in mind that your website might want to work on the iPhone, so maybe fluid design could uh, be an idea. Or maybe that could work out quite well somehow. Yeah, but it didn't stay that way. So the tablet came. Okay, yeah, responsive design. That might be a solution. So create different versions of your designs within Photoshop. That would work out well. A lot of people do that. I think all of you already did that. So is that the great thing to go? Create three versions of your design and you're well to go? Yeah. Really? No? Okay. Hmm. Let's have a look. So what's that? That are all screen resolutions of Android devices in 2013. So remember how that, or think about how that might look like in 2014. Really? A good idea to have three designs? Or maybe four? Switch back to one design for each of those screen sizes? Yes! <laughs> maybe your designers will have to have some work. <laughs> maybe they will work on the web design for like about a year. No, you don't want to do that. So somehow you have to rethink your design workflow. You have to find different possibilities. So to quote Stephen Hay, he said something in 2012 at the Breaking Development Conference in Orlando. He said, we are not designing pages, we are designing the systems of components. And I think he's perfectly yeah, clear with that, and I totally agree. This is what you want to do when supporting all those different devices, when creating websites for the current world of yeah, element, uh, web, uh, devices to show the websites inside. So how to achieve that? You need something for that. You can't just go on with Photoshop. And this is where the atomic design comes into. So what is atomic design? Did anyone already hear about that? M maybe not when reading my abstract. Okay, that's at least some. Who already worked with atomic design? Also some, but still quite less. I had a talk with some guy at our near school sprint last week and he said, well, you're talking about atomic design. What exactly do you say? Yeah, it's a general idea what atomic design is about. And he said, what the fuck are you doing? Why do you want to do that? Because I think that people are eager to know what that is and try it out and hear what it is about. He said, what, 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 why would you want to do that? Everyone already knows what atomic design is. It's totally clear. Everyone uses us already. So yeah, it doesn't seem to be like that. And maybe that might be an interesting thing for you. Okay, atomic design, what you see there are different parts um, of what you would work with. So the general idea is that you split your design in different components and you start with a very little, most little element, which might be the atom. So an atom could be something like a link, a button, a label, the, the least small element which you could rem um, imagine which could already work on a website. The next thing 
would be a molecule. So molecules consist of different atoms. For example, like you see there, a search box element. You have a label above, you have an input field and a button next to it. So that might be some molecule thing. You see, it grows bigger. And the next thing, it's a bit small, I'm sorry. By the way, thanks to Brad Frost for those little screenies. I think everybody uses those in the atomic design um, talks. So the organisms are way bigger. It's already a complete element you would use on your website. Maybe also inside a header element, a footer, or such a whole search and, um, element you would put on the header of your website. And all those three build the basis for what's coming next. And the next thing would be the template. A template is a very generic thing where you just put organisms, molecules and atoms together. You just mix them the way you want them to be and to look like and you have some generic element to show what the general impression might be. Um, but that's not all. Finalize this, you have the page. A page is something like an instance of a specific template. So you really try to put final content inside. You don't, know, you still, you don't use those image um, blind text element thingies, but you really put real images inside. If possible, real text would also be great, but yeah, we know our customers. That sometimes doesn't work out quite well, but if possible, that would be great. So to really create something like a main page, like a list page for articles, a product page or something like that. So this is what you formally would have created as the first PSD file. So when we think about those names, atoms, molecules, templates and so on, don't mix those up with, for example, a PSD template or an HTML template. It's just the word template because they had to think about a name so that you can talk to each other and use some words for communication so that you know what you're talking about. So don't, mi don't mix that up. It's just, you could also talk, tell it, or call it, whatever. So how would that look in practice? It sounds great, but yeah, how should you work with that? A perfect atomic design workflow could look, for example, like that. You start with Photoshop and create your homepage. Great. Do you do that? No, of course not. Definitely not. So when you now start with your process, you have different possibilities. For example, you could start with Photoshop. Of course you can do. But dependent on what your customers' needs are and, or of, of course, what your developers' and designers' capabilities are, you can, of course, also directly start with prototyping. Maybe in HTML, maybe with some different tools. That totally depends. You can use what you want. The most important thing is think about creating different components. So whether you use Photoshop or prototyping, you definitely should start by creating atoms, molecules, organisms at first. So, for example, you start creating some atom-molecule mixture, have, for example, your header area already done, show it to your customer, maybe in two or three different ways below each other. Create, like, style guide element mixtures of all those elements you already created, but don't create final pages. Involve your customer into this whole idea of starting with different smaller pieces and don't directly start with a home page. So that is the general idea of um, how to start. When you already have atoms, molecules, and organisms, you could directly go and build those inside templates or inside pages. But of course, you could also directly start a more agile way. And while your designer is creating Photoshop files with all those different elements inside, of course, your front-end guys could already start and create markup of those different components because what you created will be used on many different pages and the markup should always look the same. Of course, you might have some container stuff around which do, does something special on a certain page, but the general markup can already be created because the elements you created won't change a lot, only due to specific reasons on a certain page. So it's also a good idea to really go more agile way and not 
doing all those 10,000 Photoshop templates at first, and after half a year, start, start the first markup creation. The most important thing is that you keep the atomic design idea throughout your whole phase. So don't stop that as far as you created some Photoshop files. You definitely have to keep that in mind also for the front end development. So if your markup designers start to create your HTML, don't just drop the idea and say, well, okay, great, we did atomic design. There's our final page. Just create the markup out of that. That won't really work because that doesn't make sense. You already had the idea of atomics, uh, of atoms, molecules, and so on, and it just makes sense to go on the same way when creating your HTML and CSS because you will just benefit from that. You have smaller CSS and HTML elements because you don't need this whole um, uh, this whole um, binding to a certain page or something like that. You really focus on the different elements. So this is the moment where I would like to switch to showing you something what we really did and not talk only talking about theory. So well next, that last year there was this moment where we had this really big project and yeah, we did the same as we always did. We created designs and a lot of them. Okay, we had some iterations in front of those. We wanted to find some general CI idea for that company, but yeah, well, we created designs. Yeah, we have a look at those. But after creating like the main page, search, pa <coughs> search page and something like that, we thought, ah, we want to really bring that into the browser quite early because it's such a big project and so many more pages will follow, we really have to give the customer the possibility to already click through stuff. So we want to create with the templates, the HTML stuff, in parallel to the rest of the design phase. Yeah, and then we had a look at the designs from the front-end perspective. And we realized that there is a lot of stuff which is used all over around all the templates again. There are different elements you always have again and again and again, dependent on maybe some organism elements, but we have to reuse those. And we don't want to create HTML for the main page and for the search page and afterwards realize that, ha, shit, we already created that. But yeah, well, too late. So we thought, well, maybe I thought, there was this Frontiers conference a while ago and there was this one talk where someone talked about atomic design. So Let's have a look. Maybe we could just try that out. We have enough time, we have enough budget, so let's have a look at that. Okay, so we at least try to use um, atomic design for the front end. And what we also really wanted is to have something like a living style guide. We wanted to have the possibility to show the customer all those different components we already designed for them. We already used in all those different pages. and We wanted to make it easy for them so that they already can think on their own which components they might want to reuse on different other pages because it's so big that we don't even know which pages we all would have to design. So that was a win-win situation because it was a bit of more better overview for us but also the chance for the customer to have an easy look at all those different things we already created for them. But how could you easily achieve that? course we didn't want to sit down and create our own system for yeah somehow creating a list of all elements and what we earlier did in Photoshop taking all those PSD files we already created picking out all those different elements we had putting that below each other inside an own Photoshop file which will be called like a mixture of everything and no we didn't want that we wanted a already running solution in which we could put what we needed for our customer. So we wanted an already running style guide, a living style guide. And the great thing is there is something which is also created by Brad Frost and his other guys and it's called Pattern Lab. Pattern Lab is 
a toolkit to create atomic design systems. That sounds great. Yeah. So what, what is it really? Pattern Lab um, has some really different things inside. Just to give a rough overview, there for example is a static site generator. That means you write your markup and you write some other things I will show later. And then you have something yeah, on a command line. Don't think about that now. Um, but what it does, it is compiles the stuff so that you can just open an HTML file in your browser and there you have like your complete component library. So all this technical stuff behind the scenes is completely given by Pattern Lab. It's all inside. You don't have to develop anything on your own. And your component library is directly your living style guide. So you already have the chance to view all your different atoms, molecules, organisms, and also your templates and pages you might have created already inside your markup. So that's definitely a good thing to have. And it's also something, it's simple URL. You can just put the stuff on your server, share the URL with your customer, and the customer already has a running living style guide. What it also brings is a viewport resizer. Maybe, yeah, that's something your developers might not really need because, of course, it's inside every browser and so on. But it's just handy in that case because you have some little buttons and also an input some input fields where you can just resize everything to your current leads. And the good thing is, I don't know how your customers work, but a lot of those I know don't really care about resizing the browser to have a look how that might look inside the iPhone or something like that. And maybe in that phase, it's not about already running the stuff inside the iPhone or the Android phone or whatever. So this tool is easy usable for your customer. And you, you can already try out how the different viewports might look like. It's a really easy thing. Of course, Pattern has, has a lot more inside. And you can have a look at this, ur this URL where everything is listed and explained, the whole documentation and so on. And I would say that we'll have a short demo of the Pattern Lab demo. Yeah, that's great because I don't see anything, but that will work out somehow. Wow. Yeah, that's not too cool. Oh, too bad. I'm sorry. I tested everything, but not that part. There you go. So what you see here is um, the very, very basic version of um, the Pattern Lab demo. So when you download Pattern Lab and you open the HTML file provided with that, this is what you directly see without compiling anything. So this is what they bring shipped with it. You have the different um, atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages, and you can directly for example, choose your home page. So, of course, that doesn't look too sexy because it's just the demo page, but just remember your own site in there. And then you can just have a look how your home page looks like. You can also go to the template version of that home page. So, to get a better glimpse of what the difference between a template and a home uh, and the final page is, this is a really nice thing also to explain to everyone who should work with that. But that's not all. Of course, you have all those organisms inside and molecules and so on. So you can switch and only view the header element. So you have the possibility to view every element which is there inside the context in which it will be used afterwards. But you can also have a view at exactly this pure element. So the way this is organized is done by your developers. So for example, 
um, if they keep with the structure of atoms till pages, it will look like this. And this um, mixture of different elements is created by the files which the developers create and the, the, the folders. So it's completely flexible. You can totally use what you want and, for example, create this global folder inside the, the uh, as an organism folder and put everything inside what you think is global. So it's just a naming thing. So and if you afterwards maybe think that the, the order should be something different or you would re reorder it in, in another folder, you just rename the file and everything is directly changed after compiling. But yeah, we don't have to look at that now. So that's a really easy thing to structure the stuff, especially when you already start within, a, in a, within an early phase of your project and afterwards realize well, the thing, we, uh, the, the way we ordered the stuff in the beginning does now not really work out anymore. We have to change that a little bit. Then you can just go to your files, rename them, and everything works out well. Because the naming is just by numbers in front, and the folders don't matter. So all your template stuff won't go wrong afterwards. It's really, really nice, easy thing, and it has no disadvantages at all. Okay, the template files names are a bit like having numbers in the beginning and everything, but I think that's no real drawback, so nobody cares about that. Of course, we also have those molecules in here, and we can just switch and have a look at those. And here is this um, viewport resizer I talked about. So if we now go to the home page, we can, for example, say, yeah, let's do it smaller and then it directly resizes. So in this case, um, everything changes a bit, de of course, dependent on your CSS you wrote or the JavaScript or whatever you have on your website. So I think for a s first impression, that's already enough. And we switch back to the keynote. Okay. So, back to our project workflow. What we did is, after having all those designs and thinking about using pattern labs or atomic design and pattern labs, we extracted the components out of that. So we had a look at this and, and found out which atom, which might, what might be an atom and what might be a molecule and an organism and who, which of those are reused throughout the different pages and how could we build the different templates out of that. We had a team of like three to four people and the whole process was completely new for everyone. I started at first and gained a bit of experience, but the others came inside the project like in the middle and just yeah, were thrown into cold water, um, if you could say so, and had to somehow get an experience on their own. So. Um, this is why we, we really took some time to think, really think about how the different molecules and organisms could, could be like and how we would want them to be. In this whole phase, we already had our CMS in mind. So in this case, it's a Type 3 CMS project, but that, that didn't really matter for this whole atomic design process. It could also have been NEOS or, of course, nothing else. It could only be Type 3 CMS or NEOS, of course. Well, um, and so what we thought when thinking about molecules and atoms and so on, we already had in mind how we would put that into the CMS to make the editors, uh, to give the editors the possibility to edit the stuff. So when creating um, organisms, we already thought about a fluid template, which might afterwards create a flexible content element. So we are working with some self-made solution of creating flexible content elements, which you might have done with Templar Walla before. Um, if you would have a NEOS project, of course, this would be um, a fluid template for a node type, but that doesn't really matter. But what was for us uh, important for us is that we, didn't ha um, we wouldn't have to have the same work again, creating the templates and afterwards starting again 
finding out which parts of all those elements would be, should be put inside an FCE. So we already had that in mind in the very first beginning. What I want to show you now is a little bit of code. I'm sorry. Um, but I would like to give you a short impression on, on how the work with pattern labs looks like. And that it's really not yeah, that difficult and uh, your front-end developers should easily be, be able to, to work with that. So this is something which is called a moustache template. Moustache, because there are all those nice curly brackets inside. So that's where the name comes from. Um, what you see there, next to this normal A href stuff, you see two areas with curly brackets. Those are variables. So next to mus creating moustache templates, which is like the same you're doing with HTML, but using dot moustache in the ending, um, is that you have a JSON file. You have several JSON files, we have one global. So the global JSON file can contain content for your basic variables. So if you have, for example, this links, link text here in your global um, JSON file, you just add something like, this is my link text. So that if this atom is output, then you already have some real text inside. The same goes with the classes and of course every variable you have. So let's have a look at the next step. A molecule could, for example, look like this. You see this normal UL structure. In this case, it's something like a teaser list. So, for example, we want to output a list of articles. Okay, that's a very simple one, but you get a glimpse of that. So what those curly brackets do, it starts with the hash thing and ends with the slash thing. So everyone who knows a bit of HTML knows that the slash always ends something. And it's the same like here. This is a simple loop. So what you do there, the output would be a UL with several allies inside. The amount of allies depends on what you write in so into your JSON file. So for example, in your basic general JSON file, you just create like Inside teaser list, I have three times the variable text with one, two, three inside. And then when you uh, um, output the, um, the molecule and view it inside pattern, the pattern labs um, HTML, then you will directly see the list with those three bullet points. The next thing would be the organism. So an organism is the biggest thing before the template comes, as we already heard. And this one looks like only having curling brackets because I left all those stiff stuff, which might be around the way. And what this would, be, would output is, of course, you have the header in the beginning with some here is my header stuff inside. The next thing would be a molecule called teaser latest. So this is the way how you call molecules. You directly put, um, after this greater than sign, put the name molecules, and afterwards the file name. If you leave all that stuff with the numbers and everything for the ordering for the interface completely gone, uh, completely away. So this is the um, advantage which I already talked about. If you reorder everything afterwards, you change the numbers, you change the order structure, this system doesn't care about that. So this inclusion of the teaser latest will still work and you can read or order everything for the interface. So the second include would be our teaser list we had in the beginning, uh, we had the one in on the slide before. And the, la the last thing is the atom with the link all. So inside an organism, you can of course not only include molecules, you can also include atoms. You could of course also include other organisms, but this is like totally up to you and what you think makes sense in that case. What's a bit special here is this link text all news in rounded, cor rounded brackets. This is a possibility to override the general JSON content of that atom. So we had that before. Um, the atom had the variable link text. Maybe in your JSON fi file there is something like my link to whatever. And in this case, for the output of this organism, 
instead of my JSON file content, that would be written all news. So you also have the flexibility to change output content dependent on the context. So when you create um, your pen templates and pages, maybe um, you already thought about this problem because I said the pages should already create the final content. And if you have your general JSON file and should reuse everything all over again, yeah, that won't work out. So what you also can do is you can create JSON files for each template. That's quite easy. You just name the JSON file the same your template's name is, only with JSON in at the end, and that will directly work out. And you put just all this JSON uh, variable code inside which you want to use for this final template or page. You can do that with every molecule, every organism, every atom. With the atoms, it might not, be make, might not make that much sense, but so you have the possibility to really have, an, have, um, the, the po you have the possibility to really put all that content inside you want at a specific area or at a specific output. And you're not bind to your general JSON file. It's just like the JSON file, the general one is your dummy text, and the specific ones are more specific. So I would like to, s to show you another demo. By the way, this whole demo stuff, I only do that because uh, I was told that the resolution of the screens is so bad that screencasts just don't work if the resolution is too high. So, which is why I try to do it better. Yeah, I should have tested that. I'm sorry. So, this is my local version of um, the pattern lab stuff we created for this one big project I already talked about. What you already see is it doesn't really look different than the other demo I already showed you. The reason behind that is, yeah, like it always is inside projects, we thought in the beginning, ah, we keep those colors and fonts already, ah, we keep those, we don't want to change those because we want to use those. We want to just put the colors, our CI colors inside there, our fonts we use inside, so that we have a real, a real living style guide. Yeah, well, the project launched in around June. We didn't find the time until now, but we just keep them there because we still have the idea to change that. But if we have a look, for example, here, we already see it's looking a bit different. And I can just switch to the home page. Ignore that one, it won't work because there's a JSON file loading stuff which doesn't exist, but that doesn't matter. So what we see is the output of the home page we created. And like I said, we can switch the resolution or the, the, the viewport. And what you here see is it changed a bit, so this is not really possible with only CSS. So also JavaScript works quite well inside that elements. And this is also, like I said, a really good thing for the customer because he has the easy possibility, like I'm telling him, okay, we just created this little JavaScript snippet and may just have a look whether you like it, whether it works out well for you or whether we have to change it. Send the link with the updated pattern lab file and he just resizes it and because he knows it's the home page, I told him. And um, he has the easy possibility of, of trying out how the different viewports would look like with this element. So you don't always have to exchange static templates or create a screencast or something like that of your home, your created markup or something. Um, it's a really good thing to work with the com your customer and to always keep him up to date and keep him up to date of the development process. So just have a quick look at some more elements. So we have this currently somehow broken header element. Also, we have different molecules. For example, this teaser. Can have a look at a bit more interesting one. Um, normally, if the resolution would be bigger, you would also have some buttons here with S, M, L, and XL. So you can easily switch between those different resolutions. You can predefine those so that you don't always have to type in those numbers here, which might be a bit easier for your customer <laughs> instead of always knowing, like, uh, what was it with the iPhone? Um, 
So just to have a, light, um, so a little, little impression, that might already be enough. And we'll switch to the keynote again. So does that stuff have any broad drawbacks? Yeah. No, no, yeah, yes, um, sorry. But of course, everything has some drawbacks. There is nothing which is perfect. Um, what I think, for me, it was really difficult to get inside this whole way of thinking, finding out what is a molecule, what is an organism. We really had it several times during our process that I cre created something as a molecule and afterwards realized, nah, no, it's an organism, or the other way, uh, oft more often the other way around. So that's really something you have to get used to. You really have to just try it out and work with it, and you will just learn the way of working and also your way of working during the process. That's really important. And I don't think that if you would now start, that the both of us or the many of us would have, would have the exact same way of defining molecules and organisms. I think that also totally depends on how you work and how you do your stuff. So the next thing is, I personally think it's really hard to start with atoms. I, can't really imagine f having a designer and just for the first time creating a button and that's it. That really sounds difficult to me. So what I would think is when you start with the design phase or prototyping phase, you start with molecules and organisms. And then you have, for example, the first two or three, like a header element or something like that, and then take those atoms out and put them in a different like Photoshop file, prototyping file or whatever and reuse those for new components. So this is something what I would like to try out for the next project. Another thing is, from my point of view, the really biggest drawback, we have double markup. Uh, and where? Yeah, of course I said we write those moustache templates. And of course, those won't be directly used inside your CMS. Okay, maybe some of you are using a CMS which directly works with moustache, uh, I don't. So what we thought is we would love to create a pattern lab version which works with Fluid. So that you can directly create Fluid templates instead of moustache. So that doesn't matter whether you use CMS or NEOS, you will have the possibility to use Fluid templates in both systems. So in case of NEOS, we already thought about creating a package which ships pattern labs with a fluid version so that you can directly create your node types built in pattern labs with final markup. So that would be something I would really like and I hope we will find the time to really do that. So if there is anyone who really likes that idea too, just feel free to contact us or me and we will yeah, think about how we could achieve that. The last thing, I think working with atomic design really needs some discipline. It doesn't work out if you have a whole team and everyone does whatever he wants. Everyone has to work with that approach. It doesn't work out when two front-end developers and one does it and the other not, because that inside the same project, of course, because that doesn't make any sense. You lose every advantage you would have when using atomic design. So you definitely, your whole team has to go with you and to take the same approach you do. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Berit Lubeck and I'm working at Network Team as front-end developer, project manager in Type 3 NEOS and CMS integrator. And yeah, thanks.